A nightclub shooting prompts action to combat an escalation of violent crime in Little Rock. As the Senate prepares to resume talks about health care, Arkansas's two members have been noticeably quiet. A presidential panel's request for voter information has the governor saying it's too broad. And after a few nervous months for finance officials, Arkansas ends the budget year with a surplus. That's just ahead on Arkansas Week. Local broadcast of Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the award-winning Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Arkansas's largest major newspaper, bringing you local, national, and international news since 1819. By the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday. And thanks for joining us for Arkansas Week. I'm Michael Hiplin, News Director of KUAR Public Radio for Central Arkansas. I'll be sitting in for Steve Barnes this week. 2017 has been a violent year so far for Arkansas, and in particular, the capital city of Little Rock. Uh, we've had children as young as toddlers who have been shot, and the violence uh, just has been growing so far this year. But it was one incident in particular last weekend that really got the attention and had leaders saying something needs to be done. And of course, I'm talking about the shooting at the Power Ultra Lounge. Joining me to discuss this is Little Rock Mayor Mark Stodola. Thanks for making time for us. You bet, Michael. I'm glad to be here. This was the worst mass shooting in the country since the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. Thankfully, this was very different than this. It wasn't an active shooter, but rather it appeared to be uh, some rivals during a, a concert who opened fire. 25 people uh, hit by gunfire, uh, and amazingly, uh, none of them died. That's correct. Thank God uh, it was really a miracle that no one died, and we're so very fortunate that, that our uh, police officers who responded to the scene had been trained uh, on uh, a various life-saving uh, 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 activities such as using tourniquets and uh, chest patches and things of that nature. So uh, that definitely had a very, very positive impact on saving people's lives. Uh, and certainly this nightclub uh, incident is um, a terrible, terrible thing that happened. It's an aberration. It's not something that typically happens. And uh, obviously we're working very, very hard, our police department actively investigating this. Uh, it was really a compliment to uh, our police department and ATF and the U.S. Marshal's Office that the rap singer, uh, which uh, had some level of provocation in this issue, uh, was arrested down in uh, Birmingham, Alabama uh, the next day before he was doing another concert. So uh, we're very thankful to have him behind bars and are actively uh, interrogating him as well on this issue. Yeah, and he at this point is being considered a person of interest, though he is facing an unrelated uh, charge uh, for an incident in Forest City. That's correct. Uh, he had a warrant out because of a, an altercation uh, at a concert, or right after the concert, uh, over in Forest City. Well, this has brought uh, a lot of scrutiny to Little Rock and how the police department has handled the escalation in violent crime. And in the hours immediately after this shooting, the governor uh, said on, uh, put out a statement saying that a comprehensive enforcement strategy was needed to uh, combat this problem. Uh, tensions have been uh, uh, building between rival groups, and there's been some hesitation to necessarily call this a gang situation. Uh, you don't feel this is similar to, say, what Little Rock went through uh, back in the uh, mid-90s? Well, uh, as you know, I was the prosecuting attorney back in the mid-90s, and uh, um, it is not the same as the type of gangs that we had then. Uh, you know, I had uh, a tremendous amount of work uh, on that issue of gangs and understand it very, very clearly. In this instance, it's more like the Hatfields and the McCoys. We have some extended families that have retaliated against each other. We got some young thugs that are using weapons um, against each other, retaliatory, uh, retaliating um, uh, against each other. And um, 
that's the kind of thing that's happening right now. And we've been, we've had some arrests. We've had some people that have, have been surrendered by their parents. So we're working a variety of different strategies to get these people off the streets. And fundamentally, what we need is we need the people who know the perpetrators and what happened to come and volunteer information. It's very, very difficult, very, very difficult to get information from these people in the streets. And so we need community cooperation as it relates to this gradual escalation of violence that we've seen since the fall of last year. Yeah, people don't want to be a snitch per se. That's but. correct. Now, you know, we, we spend, uh, when you look at the overall uh, crime issues in, in crime rates in Little Rock, um, uh, eighty one percent of our our uh, criminal activity is is property crimes uh, it's nonviolent crimes eighteen percent is violent crimes and of course those violent crimes get the attention they get the uh, a lot of resources dedicated to it so uh, you know I can tell you that uh, our police department is uh, working twenty four hours a day on trying to solve and apprehend the people who are involved in the shooting at the power ultra lounge but the uh, violence rate uh, it's 24 percent uh, higher than it was at this same time it's an escalation last yes year. it's been a, there's been an escalation um, if you compare from one year to the next in terms of that yes what do you think of uh, <coughs> what the governor unveiled this uh, strategy involving uh, the FBI Arkansas State Police Pulaski County Sheriff's Office uh, really working to collaborate to share information target known gang members better supervise those who are on parole and to make jail space available for violent offenders. Well, um, I uh, called the governor on Saturday morning and briefed him on the matter, and we talked about <clears throat> the idea that we needed to have uh, uh, an organization or we needed to have some sort of group of people that worked in a multi-agency capacity. And it's, it's law enforcement focused. And uh, in the past, you know, you've had the police department working with ATF, you've had the police department working with uh, the county sheriff's office, uh, with the state police, but having them all work together at the same time is uh, the difference that this is going to make. So they'll be housed together, they'll all be working together, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, to uh, do these kinds of things. Uh, we've got a, we're part of a violence reduction network uh, that is funded through um, um, uh, the Department of Justice uh, that we've been working on. And so this is not something that just happened uh, immediately. We've been working with these organizations uh, in, in many different respects over the last uh, over the last year and a half. And the governor said <coughs> that uh, this will essentially be the uh, Little Rock Police Department's problem to solve. Well, uh, the the lead agency is the police department, so it's really uh, a Little Rock driven uh, law enforcement multi agency group that will be meeting and housed together, dedicated officers, sharing intelligence. And I should mention uh, very importantly. Uh, a couple of the things that uh, were going to be uh, elevated in terms of attention. And that is is that uh, the Department of Community Corrections, we work with them and they are going to be uh, increasing their um, uh, oversight over the people that are on parole or probation in these areas. And when we know that they're gang members uh, that are coming out of prison, that have been affiliated with gangs, they're going to be given extra special uh, scrutiny on this because I can tell you that we have a 50% recidivism rate um, uh, that goes back to the penitentiary. And when you have felons uh, who are involved in a variety of illegal activities, they usually have a weapon. So we want to make sure that we get the, the weapons out of the hands of, of felons uh, that are on parole and probation. That doesn't mean that everyone is, but it does mean that we know that there are those that, that are prone to violence. And, and if they are carrying a weapon, we've got we've to be extra vigilant on that. You have gotten some uh, criticism from some saying that the Little Rock Police Department isn't doing enough to really go into the poor black neighborhoods in the city. That uh, uh, in this case, you had the Power Ultra Lounge shut down within one day, but uh, some like Benny Johnson with the Stop the Violence group say you've got nuisance businesses that remain open where crime repeatedly occurs and you don't have officers who come in and spend enough time really trying to change things in uh, poorer neighborhoods. Well, I don't think that's a, a complete picture, and I, I, you know, I've worked with Benny Johnson on, on a variety of issues. He's talking about some areas on 12th Street, which we actually have in our criminal abatement program. Uh, the activity is not going on inside the businesses, it's going on outside the businesses. We've tried to shut them down legally. 
uh, and we're working on a new creative way to try and do that as well. But we go in and we are, are actively working on those locations. And uh, we, take, we take criminal activity that occurs anywhere in the city very seriously. And city resources are, are put in in a variety of different ways, uh, whether it be in terms of neighborhood improvements, uh, rebuilding neighborhoods, uh, crime prevention programs, uh, a variety of things that uh, are directed toward the long-term vestiges that help to create the criminal environment that we see. Uh, you know, it's a big job. Um, we've got a, you, sometimes you get, it gets lost in the, in the, the uh, dialogue of what's really going on. So when you have something like the, the Power Ultra Lounge that happens, it, it, it overshadows some of the really good work that's been happening. For example, let me give you an example. Uh, over the last, um, uh, we obviously have been working on this issue of increased violence in these drive-by shootings. Uh, the month of June went without a homicide. Um, and, uh, and on July 1st, we had two domestic violence homicides, strangulations. And, and so we got, a, we got a domestic violence issue that's just as important uh, as, as some of these other issues, but it doesn't necessarily always get the attention. So we, we've got programs in terms of prevention. We know that if we can try and prevent crime from happening, that's really where we want to do it. And so um, uh, we've got five and a half million dollars of the taxpayers' dollars that we spend on, on uh, prevention and intervention programs, uh, felony reentry programs, a job program. Um, so again, those are, those are the things that are long-term that are hopefully going to change the environment uh, to make sure that we get safer streets. Little Rock Mayor Mark Stodola, thanks for coming in to talk with us about you bet. this. Thank you, Michael. And we'll be back in just a moment with our panel. We're joined now by our panel to continue our conversation about violence in Little Rock's capital city. Joining me from the Political Science Department at the University of Central Arkansas is Heather Yates, Wes Brown works for Talk Business and Politics, and Steve Bronner is an independent journalist. And Wes, we were both at the uh, announcement Thursday by the governor mm -hmm. about this new coalition. Uh, and one thing I was struck by was the governor said, this isn't just about Little Rock. Mm -hmm. What happens in Little Rock impacts the whole state in a number of uh, ways, including economic development. Right, right. Uh, the governor has been, uh, I guess his mantra has been jobs, uh, economic development governor. He's gone outside the, the state. He was in Europe last couple of weeks ago uh, recruiting jobs. So he believes that, uh, you know, as, as Little Rock goes, so goes the rest of the states. Little Rock is central to economic development. It's the center of government. It's the capital city. It's uh, the largest, uh, l largest urban center. It's the largest uh, uh, population of, of, of black and minorities. So it's important in a lot of ways. So uh, I think his uh, uh, once once all of this happens with the with the shooting uh, last week, uh, it, it obviously came to a kind of a head, and the governor had to get involved. I think he was compelled to get involved. The details of exactly how this partnership will work are still uh, unknown to a good degree. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your takeaway from this? Well, I, I, I you know, I think uh, as, as Mayor Stodel and some of the others have said, uh, the police departments, there's been other task force uh, in the past on crime. Uh, this coalition, uh, I think the two added things, uh, he brought the state police in and we'll have a little bit more presence and also the, the, uh, the, the input of the FBI. I think that's a new role that we haven't obviously seen in the past. And, and he also said it's possible that other uh, federal agencies and other groups could get involved, a ATF, you know, to obviously with the gun-related issues. But, but I think there's room for, uh, I think he also said that possibly two personnel from each agency will man a, a permanent kind of investigative group. So that's that's kind of news. So it's it's task force is always. I think this governor is one of the uh, interesting things is that he's governed largely by task force. When he has an issue, 
Uh, Steve, you've seen that quite a bit, an, an issue that takes place in the state government. When there's a problem, he calls a task force, he calls a special group together to tackle these problems because he likes to see uh, a kind of a coalescing of the mind. So I think the, uh, that is, it is not unusual that a task force would be called, but uh, it'll remain to be seen. Are there measurables? What, what will improve if, if there will be immediate results, uh, uh, as people have said, on the streets? And, and I think that's going to be the the testament to, to whether this is going to be effective or not. Heather, this puts the uh, mayor in a pretty uh, tricky spot. He's getting, you know, uh, it's a tough position for him. Politically, uh, what do you take as you uh, have seen this? Well, politically, what we're, we're seeing with incidents like this in urban cores across uh, the United States, and it's now touched Arkansas, is we're seeing the nationalization of localized politics. And nationalization meaning, let's take a you know walk back a couple of years, the national rhetoric um, has has pivoted around this idea of law and order, um, citizens needing to feel safe and secure, um, what policies are necessary for citizens to feel safe and secure, that activates and, and automatically um, we all, you know, divert our attention to gun rights policy discussion. And then there's the very practical economic side of this politically too. Governor Hutchinson is exactly right that increased crime um, and, and happening in the state's capital impacts economic development and for a governor who's made his one of his premier platforms of attracting um, trade and business to Little Rock this this commission actually is a smart political move to both um, address citizens concerns about feeling secure um, in their private lives and in their activities of leisure and businesses knowing that can, will they be protected will they be able to protect their interests and can they grow a consumer base in Little Rock so um, this is going to impact both the Little Rock mayor and governor in considering what policies are to go forth um, also considering personal civil liberties of citizens and, um, and the rights of business owners and Steve this uh, comes for uh the governor has a background in, uh, to a degree in law enforcement, being a former U.S. attorney and serving at Homeland Security and the Drug Enforcement Administration. Uh, how do you see him leading this, uh, this going forward? Well, I think he's already you know, done that by, trying, by convening this task force. Uh, he'll beat this drum. He has to. This was national news. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a major story, and when uh, the impression of people you know, across the country is of Little Rock being a, a dangerous place, uh, true or not, uh, the governor has to act. It's Little Rock, Arkansas. So I think he'll continue to make this a, a major focus, but then he has other things to do too. So ultimately this is about law enforcement. It's, it's ultimately, it's Arkansas's problem to, to deal with, but Little Rock is the primary means of, of, of dealing with it, and that's who's going to have to, have to take care of it. It was also interesting that during the legislative sessions, a lot of these issues actually came up. Uh, there was the judicial reform uh, uh, that came before the legislature, and, and these things are, are coming ahead. You, I, I, I'm guaranteed that you, over the next several months, now that the governor has stepped in, you're going to see lawmakers come to the plate and say, uh, well, this must be done, and this this whole issue of policing communities is a is a real issue that affects black communities. Uh, uh, that that is for me that's the elephant in the room. People don't want to talk about the, uh, the the mayor talked about the distrust uh, or the issue of people not coming forth. There is a dis distrust between police and not only people in the streets but also um, uh, uh, upper level blacks. Uh, in my church, I know several. Uh, of our ministers and deacons who have been stopped and had had uh, uh, you know kind of testy encounters with police so that issue is the elephant in the room that has to be discussed if you're going to bring all these issues together and talk about it. Okay well on to another topic uh, this week uh, we got word that Arkansas did receive a letter finally from the uh, Presidential Advisory Commission mm -hmm. on Election uh, Integrity. Uh, Heather this was uh, uh, something that uh, President Trump uh, introduced uh, to look at allegations of uh, voter fraud. Uh, in Arkansas, our Secretary of State uh, said that he is providing information to the uh, federal government, though it's only information that is publicly available. 
Right. So let me also um, clarify for the record that it, it states routinely will make information from their data files publicly available, but not all sensitive information. And what um, Secretary of State Mark Martin has, has been recommended to do um, from, from the words of Governor Hutchison is to treat this like a Freedom of Information Act request from Chris Kobach. So, so that means it activates a process of creating a paper trail. That also means that some information is released. It's the same data that would be released to a, a candidate's campaign here in Arkansas that would appeal to the Secretary of State's office um, for the voter voter um, records. And so how this impacts Arkansas citizens. Um, so maybe they can rest assured that um, their social security number is not going to be provided. Felony conv convictions are not going to be provided. Military status not provided. Driver's license numbers not provided. Um, and so but at the end of the day, Arkansas is one of 15 states that are complying with this request on a limited basis. So whether directly or indirectly or whether the intention is to validate the existence of the commission, states releasing this data, that's what it's conveying. And indirectly also validates any recommendations that this commission may make to the president. Yeah, but we did have the governor put out a statement on Twitter saying that uh, the request from the federal government was too broad mm -hmm. and includes sensitive information. Mm -hmm. uh, this obviously is a Republican governor, uh, very strongly uh, was supportive of uh, Trump state. Right. And you have several other states like Arkansas right. that are putting up some, uh, you know, not completely complying with uh, mm -hmm. what's requested. Mm -hmm. Well, the Secretary of State of Mississippi said right. basically yeah. they could they'll go jump in the Gulf of Mexico <laughs> right. and, from Mississippi if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of crossing party lines. It's an element, you know, uh, voting has always been done by the states. And there is definitely some pushback on this and not from Republican states and also from Democratic states who say this is really about trying to uh, suppress votes or to try to prove a point that's not there, to try to prove that President Trump's uh, claims that the election was uh, rigged or, or were not correct. Uh, so it's not, just our, it's not just Republican states, it's both Democrat and Republican states who have a problem with this. Yeah, and I, I think that, uh, you know, the National Commission that, that's led by the Secretary of State of Kansas, uh, Cobalt, is, you know, I, I think some people are saying that this commission is really going nowhere. Uh, th there's a kind of feeling that, you know, there's really not an issue, as Steve raised, that there's not an issue of voter fraud or, or problems in, in the voting electors, uh, how many people uh, in the last election, uh, voted twice or, or did something illegally uh, in the voting booth, and that and that's not a critical issue uh, that needs a, a national commission. So I think there is a general feeling, especially with the number of states that have said we we're not going to send information, and also the fact that this this uh, commission doesn't seem to be picking up steam. Yeah, is, right. is, a, is a problem. And a couple of other issues we need to make sure we uh, get to in the limited time we have left. Uh, the Senate uh, returns to Washington uh, this coming week and uh, talks are going to uh, resume on health care. Uh, Heather, first, uh, our members of the Senate here in Arkansas have been pretty quiet mm -hmm. this past week while in Arkansas. Right, right. Um, and it's in the Republicans' best interest to do so. They've been quiet. They haven't held town hall meetings out of really a favor to the Republican leadership in the Senate. Um, they, they don't have enough vote. They didn't have enough votes to take it to a successful vote before the holiday recess. And they um, and, and on pretty much on the advice of the leadership, don't hold town halls because it's going to create a PR mess that would jeopardize any Republican senator on the fence and um, really jeopardize a vote. So I it's it's been out of the interest to try to to garner the votes over the holiday recess so they can hold a vote once they return okay and the talk is it might be a few weeks they didn't have the votes before taking the uh, july 4th recess any uh, guess do you think they will be able to sway enough you know you've got the much more conservative and you've got the moderates anything that can put them together and actually get the votes needed to, to pass something. There's a variety of, of amendments out there that they're trying to cobble together to to secure and, and all three factions or wings of the Republican Party, um, one being the Cruz Amendment. But mm -hmm. as of now, um, there's no word that that is the, the one Band-Aid effect that's bringing all parties to the table. So time will tell, but unlikely not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, in the Cruz Amendment that she uh, mentioned the, to repeal Obamacare and then wait at some point later to come up with another plan has not gotten much steam. And even our governor, Governor Hutchins, said that's that's not that's not doable. That's not not a plan. Mm -hmm. So uh, nothing seems to be a coalescing uh, uh, around any any support. 
Basically, we've gone from repeal and replace to reform. I mean, this is, if they do anything, it's not going to, it will keep much of Obamacare there. It, we, are, we are away from repeal and replace. Okay. Mm -hmm. One final issue, uh, revenue. We got mm -hmm. the last revenue report of the year, Wes, mm -hmm. and uh, it was good news. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that you had the governor warning agency heads, you be prepared, make contingency plans if you have to make big uh, budget cuts. But uh, for June, we ended up uh, with a surplus. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's uh, good news of June was a really robust June and, and May were pretty good months that got us over the top. There was, uh, uh, I think the surplus was 15.7 million. So we go into fiscal 2018, which begins July 1st with, with you know, kind of on, on even footing and, and feeling good about ourselves, yeah. you know. So. Uh, what what uh, what happened? What's the short explanation? I, I, you know, I think uh, you know. Uh, one, there was a revision earlier in in the uh, in the quarter. So, and then you know we had corporate income that was up. So, uh, uh, sales and use tax was was up. All categories were up across the board. So we saw an improvement in the economy and seeing things move move in a different direction. But still. Uh, just as the national economy, that nothing in the state economy has shown any momentum, any consistency. So we could see a few down months beginning in, in the year fiscal 2018 when it starts. So. Okay. Uh. Well, with that, we'll uh, wrap it up. Thanks for joining us this weekend for Arkansas Week. I'm Michael Hiplin. Thanks to our panel and Mayor Stodola, and we'll see you next time. Local broadcast of Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the award-winning Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Arkansas's largest major newspaper, bringing you local, national, and international news since 1819. By the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday.